I'm Coco, and for those of you who don't know me, which I imagine is about 98.97 of you, I'm a rapper and a musician and a screenwriter and visual artist. But I've spent the last few months at the University of Hawaii, where I've been researching gentrification in the Pacific, notably urban communities, and how that starts to transmogrify and distort urban, urban stuff at the Centre of Pacific Island Studies. Uh, I'm Māori and German Samoan. I made my name in underground rap and punk back home before diversifying my bonds and moving into comics and screen work and a wide range of other oppressive male-dominated industries. So I have a pretty sophisticated palette when it comes to patriarchy. Um, the reason I believe I'm here to speak with this audience and why I'm in this really surreal, mind-blowing situation and really nervous is because I believe that those traditionally excluded from the jaundiced music business template can now be the key figures to restore music holistic potential. From how it's recorded right through to how one releases it, music traditionally runs on a business model at odds with the ancient and socially therapeutic values of music. And I don't think artists today should have to hide or water down their cultural practices and worldview in the name of white professionalism. I don't think women and femme leaders should have to put out, put out outcome-driven thinking before more intuitive, collaborative processes. And at this point in history where abuses of power are a daily conversation, I think we can reclaim it by forging a more community-based recording culture. So I've found from moving in academic circles that a lot of people would rather listen to a man with a degree in women's studies before they listen to a woman. So I can unpack my discography and qualifications with you later, but I've got 15 minutes, so I'm gonna just get to it. You can ask me who the hell I think I am later. So um, do we have the guts to put mentoring increased access, authentic equality and sovereignty before hit factory exclusivity mentality. These are the things that the recording industry often hinges on, so this is the question I've got. I think we're reaching a social point in the free world where the farcical aspects of capitalism and leadership now everyone basically realises things are fucked up, not just the marginalised not just those who are regularly struggling with equality. Even the people who are just merely privy or even benefiting from those systems can see that those systems are no longer sustainable. And our livelihood will suffer if we don't start radically thinking, which I personally don't think is radical at all, but I'm gonna I'm go on. My entry point into this conversation, as it will be for a lot of you, is through music, is through artistry. That is my weapon of choice. So we're often given artists are the mirror of society as kind of a shtick. And I think if this is the case, then we need to really clean the mirror immediately and understand it's not just about empowering jams and diversity aesthetics like that we present to the world. We need to actually set an example of how works get produced we need to be leading in genuine frameworks of what is possible. So I've always maintained that the music industry is a people-based situation. It often gets presented to me as a mysterious machine, you know, it's just the way things are, we'll never quite understand it. But it's actually just comprised of people like you and me. And I think it's always been at the front of destabilised markets and reimagined definitions of success. So we almost have to formally take that responsibility as an industry to do that. And back home I come from a cut of predominantly Māori and Pacifica Polynesian creatives. So for me, bringing an indigenous way of seeing to my work, even if the work is not seen as being explicitly native in nature. And I was just saying that um, I had an interesting conversation with an American man from the Midwest who was surprised to learn that Māori have the internet. And um, we do, we are on the internet. 
And th so it's not radical to me. It's not until I'm in a professional environment, which is to say Eurocentric environments that fetishise the plight of the individual, that reward technical over emotional and spiritual practice, that guard its resources for the worthy or the culturally valuable, that I see what a different paradigm and language I speak, what a different way that I live. So in indigenous cultures, particularly in the Pacific, you should eat together, you should learn each other's personal and familial journeys before you embark on building something special. This to me is logical. I find those who think a simple practice like this is excessive, are often thinking of an audience engagement all the time, but they don't see the potential in community engagement, how something was created could heal and tr transform those who made it and those who consume it, which I think is the process, the creative process equivalent of acting local and thinking global. So I'm often asked, who is allowed in the booth? The studio culture allow wahine, which is women, and LGBTI to compose and work at high levels of industry because as we can see from the revealing influx of women of different racial and religious backgrounds that have recently been elected this week in this country, there's an understanding that the laser-like focus of someone directly affected by an issue are the ones best trusted to articulate a problem. So conversations of progression and new waves and music's constant hunger for a revolutionary sound, I think can be satiated by we can only be satiated by inclusion and taking those two commonly ostracized and involving them. And I don't see this involvement as a charitable act either. Our worldview is something you need right now to pop culturally survive. We know it and so do you. So I'm not suggesting you hire a Girl Friday with an ethnic twist, you know, you need to go beyond that. I'm suggesting you elect and incorporate people at all levels of the music making process and give them leadership opportunities. Trust them. If they don't have that confidence, then we should be mentoring so they're able to practice and express their talent and give us access to the reimagined system inherently in their muted DNA. So this will then be seen in the lyricism, the aesthetics, the narratives of not just the storytelling, but in the oral audio plane too. We'll see new possibilities of structuring the music itself, and I really don't think that's an exaggeration. Pop culture has been at the gatekeeping mercy of white male understandings of taste for the last few centuries at least, and this isn't a secret, I hope it's not a secret to you, because cat's out of the bag if it is. And if you think that doesn't distort the ideologies surrounding definitions of good taste, high quality, respectable processes, industry standards, what is technically gifted, then you need to be incorporating minorities into your practice, which, and even the semantics of minorities, you know, these are majorities with a colonial avatar. We'll go into that another time. And in the same way, you may need exposure to these perspectives because they offer new ways of seeing which are often as old as the hills. They've just literally been suppressed or cropped out of you. So you can look beyond a voice on the hook, a pretty voice, and start thinking about who are we allowing to create the cultural canon right now and amplifying those who could politically transform this climate. It, be it goes beyond the superficiality of diversity initiatives, which are very popular. It needs to be systemic. It needs to be in our music criticism, in our engineering rooms, in music videos, in our management, at, within every single facet of the industry. So for me personally, I feel a responsibility as a visible artist in my home country to pull resources because I know firsthand how painful it can be to not have access to opportunities that you know you inherently deserve if it weren't for your signifier here. I think I started off this talk with my mihi, my Māori introduction, because it grounds me 
as well as it being a decolonial thing. It connects me to the grander fabric of which I'm just a small part, my history, the people who made me. So this helps me imagine this room as less of an industry thing and it connects me as more of a potential community member. This makes it accessible and kinder to someone like me who has a fairly precarious cultural cachet when it comes to the biz, you know? So, as an indigenous wahine who occasionally creates shards of culture, I advocate for wahine-centric leadership because I see the positivity it creates. I lead from a place of intuition. I prioritize the process. I want both collabors and the audience to have a connection and a memory with me or the work. And if I can't give them that, I can at least give them insight into my story, something they may not have known about. Because in trusting my leadership, they're seeing my codes, my semantics, which create my narrative, and narratives up upholster my entire reality. So coming from a culture that prizes the oratory tradition, storytelling to me isn't really a joke. Even if the end result is a, oh baby, you drive me crazy, I know that a lot of love went into that. I know a lot of thought went into that at least. There's an idea that women do a lot of emotional labor or invisible labor in the creative process. And I just call that labor because I see the perspectives of other people getting dressed down often and it's very real. It's a very valuable input that an industry infested with misogyny and constant gentrification needs to treat as real labor. So, in conversations of reimagining what is possible for the future of music, I think it's very tangible. I think it's very simple and it's very practical. You recruit and you genuinely listen, not just performatively. You include those who have had their voices, their bodies and their land stolen or legislated to death. I think it's the least the music community can do. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>